The Planck equation is the gateway to modern physics, so it's obviously one of the most important equations in history, and also one of the shortest. Wow, this is a bit of a letdown. E, the energy of the photon, is equal to H, Planck's constant, times the photon's frequency. Yep, that equation's pretty short, but it is also the engine behind the Broyles equation for matter waves, Nobel Prize in Physics, 1929, Einstein's solution to the photoelectric effect, Nobel Prize, 1921, Bohr's model of the atom, Nobel Prize, 1922, and the Compton effect, Nobel Prize, 1927. All of these accomplishments were based directly, flowed directly out of Planck's revolutionary equation, Nobel Prize, 1918. But since this equation is so small, the question for us is, what did he do after lunch? Well, it turns out this equation doesn't really represent Planck's accomplishment. This one does. This is the equation we will derive in this video, so get excited. But even this isn't Planck's most important contribution. According to Wikipedia, Planck is the true but reluctant father of the modern concept of the quantum of energy that underlies all quantum phenomena. He is the father of quantum mechanics. He showed us that the quantities in nature are more like individual grains of sand on a beach, less like the continuous and infinitely divisible water in the ocean. More on that later. First, what is this equation? It gives the spectrum of a black body radiator. Anything, even an empty oven, will produce electromagnetic waves when it is raised to a temperature. That box is a hot oven. It is shooting out photons, all kinds of photons. A few have very short wavelengths. A few have very long wavelengths. Most are in the middle. A higher temperature object will produce more waves, and those waves will be, on average, shorter or bluer. This wicked complicated equation gives the shape of that curve. The shape was known back in the 1800s, but no one could figure out the equation until Planck and E equals HF and the quantum view of nature. In other words, Planck is responsible for explaining the toaster. It glows red when the coils are hot. Hot coils emit photons. That's just what hot things do. The filament of an incandescent light bulb is even hotter. It glows brighter and whiter. You... You are not as hot as a toaster, but your body is a heat source and produces infrared rays. So out of respect for toast everywhere, we owe it to ourselves to derive this equation. But before we derive that equation, we'll have to derive this one, the Boltzmann distribution. And this one, the Maxwell-Boltzmann speed distribution. I know what you're thinking. This is not a useless journey down the rabbit hole of classical mechanics. Well, it is a little bit, but well, here, we need these concepts from these earlier distributions in order to understand Planck, trust me, which is not surprising also, because Planck, being the inventor of modern physics or the father of quantum mechanics, that also makes him the end of classical physics. So we'll end up by explaining how Planck fixed the errors in yet another distribution, the ray Legines formula. That's an unsuccessful attempt to model the black body radiation curve. That's where we're going. This is where we'll start. The distribution energy in a physical system, the Boltzmann distribution. Let's say you are a particle in a many-particle system. That system has a certain amount of overall energy. With me so far, the Boltzmann distribution tells us that you are more likely to be a low-energy particle than a high-energy particle. But at least you'll have lots of company. Think of it in terms of economics. There is not much of a middle class in a Boltzmann society. A few wealthy particles over here. Most of us have not much energy at all. But where did that equation come from? Well, let's consider a simple example. Let's consider a system with four particles, and the total energy in the system is 4E. That's a simple enough system, but how will these particles share their energy? Here's one possibility. The violet ball gets all the energy, and the other three balls get nothing. That's one of the microstates for the 1 gets 4, 3 gets 0 macrostate. I know this picture kind of makes us all cross-eyed, but don't worry. It'll get worse. But these are the four microstates, the four permutations of the one particle gets all the energy macrostate. Here's a table of all the possible macrostates and the corresponding number of microstates. Please pause the video and work out the details for yourself, if you want. Hopefully, though, you'll agree that there is only one possible microstate for macrostate 4. The everybody gets 1e macrostate. But why are we counting up all these possible arrangements anyway? This is why, so we can find the probability of finding a particle in any possible state. 
What are the chances of you being a zero E particle in macro state number one? Well, the system has a four out of 35 chance of being in that macro state. See, all the micro states are equally probable, comma. And if we are in macro state one, you have a three out of four chance of being a zero E particle. Simple, but not exactly what we're looking for. If we know the odds of being a Mac one zero E particle, Let's multiply that by the number of particles, and that'll give us the total number of particles we expect to be in this state. Don't be alarmed that it's a fraction. A real system would have many particles, but that's the number of particles we expect to be Mach number one, zero E. Next, compute these values for every space in the grid. The number of particles out of the four particles in the system you would expect to find in every single location. Don't worry, we're almost done. Yes, there are lots of calculations, but if you sum each column, you get an energy distribution, the total number of particles that you'd expect to have, 0e, 1e, 2e, 3 and 4e, which is what we want, an energy distribution, Boltzmann's energy distribution. Notice that all these numbers in this example add to 4, but counting and probability, I thought we were going to be doing calculus. Yes, we will be, but this is a good conceptual grounding for that future work. What did we do? We found the probability of being in a given state. Then we added up all those different energy states together and graphed it. More low energy particles, fewer high energy particles, a disparity that grows as we increase the number of particles and the total energy of the system and approaches an exponential function. And this is relatively easy to prove. You just go around, find a mathematician and say, hey, prove this for me, I'm busy. I am busy we need to find out what these constant means. A, a is a normalization constant. Its job is to make sure the total number of particles in the graph matches the total number of particles in the system. Alpha is more complex. Alpha changes the shape of the curve. Look what happens when alpha shrinks. We get more high energy particles. Because we still have a long way to go, I'm going to jump to the punchline. Alpha is 1 over kT, where k is the Boltzmann constant and t is the absolute temperature in kelvins. Notice what happens to the distribution when t approaches zero. No particles get any energy at all, nothing. This is the Boltzmann distribution for any system. There are more low energy particles, fewer high energy particles. And the higher the temperature, the more higher energy particles, just what we wanted. We will apply this system to an ideal gas in just a moment, but first, I notice a similarity. Let's notice the similarity between this Boltzmann distribution and the more famous bell curve or normal distribution. They're related but different. The Boltzmann distribution has E raised to the power of negative X. The bell curve has E raised to negative X squared. That gives it its nice smooth top. You see that nice, it's smooth up there. Anyway, on to the ideal gas, the one where pressure and volume are inversely proportional to one another and where doubling the temperature at constant pressure doubles the volume. Experimenting with an ideal gas, adding and removing energy will give you a value for the ideal gas constant. If R tells you something about the total energy in the gas per mole of gas, K tells you something about the energy per particle, which is known as the equipartition theorem. I'd like to say that anything at temperature T has energy KT, but it's not quite that simple. E equals N times one half KT, where N is the number of degrees of freedom of the system. For an ideal gas, the particles have three degrees of freedom, independent motion in the X, Y, and Z directions, all contributing to the kinetic energy. So the energy of an ideal gas is three halves NKT, and we're drowning in Ns. But the point here is that KT tells us something about energy. One more example. The harmonic oscillator, like a mass on a spring. Two degrees of freedom. Take a snapshot of that spring. In order to find the total energy, you'd need to know the potential energy and the kinetic energy. Two degrees of freedom, energy equals kT. Now, it's probably easier to imagine an ideal gas like a giant mosh pit rather than imagine this array of springs. But that could be our model for atoms vibrating in a crystal lattice. In a moment, we will think of something even weirder. We will imagine oscillating electrons in the wall of a black body radiator, accelerating charges, giving us electromagnetic waves. Our job is to find their distribution. That is where we are headed first. Back to the ideal gas. Ideally, get it? Ideally, we'd like to know the position and the velocity of every particle all the time. 
But that's impossible. The Maxwell-Boltzmann speed distribution does the next best thing. It tells us what percent of the particles are moving at a given speed. Not all the particles are traveling at the same speed. A few are moving very slow, a few are moving very fast, most at an intermediate speed. Just like a mosh pit. Notice that the graph is not symmetric like the normal distribution, but the shape of the distribution is determined by the temperature of the gas, no surprise there, and also by the mass of the gas molecules. Curve 1 could either be a low temperature gas or heavy particles. Curve 2 could be either a hotter gas or the same temperature as curve 1 but with lighter particles. You can see that in the equation. Yikes, that's nasty. Now we're not going to derive that we, we are. We're going to derive that one. To, I can't do that. Yes. You can and you will, but first, notice that mass is inversely proportional to temperature, both here and there. Just what we wanted. But we're more interested in this part of the equation. Look! A Boltzmann distribution. A distribution of E raised to the negative E over KT. In this case, energy is 1 half mv squared. C is a normalization constant. Its job is to make sure the function adds up to give us the total number of particles in the gas. We won't go through every step of solving this integral. That would take too long, and we would need special tools. But there it is, an equation for the average velocity of a gas particle. It's not as bad as you think, but it's still pretty bad. Let's try to explain this equation using a ruler, or 10 of them. You have four 20-centimeter rulers and six 30-centimeter rulers. So the question is, what is the average length of your ruler? To find out, we'll need a weighted average. In other words, you'll take the likelihood of a ruler being in the 20 centimeter state times the length of that state plus the likelihood of a ruler being in the 30 centimeter state times the length of that state. Making sure, of course, to, that the total number of rulers adds up to 10, which is important as you add the lengths together. And this should remind you of what we did for those colored balls. Our equation for average velocity does the same thing. Look at it from right to left. We have the probability of a ruler, so, sorry, the probability of a gas particle having a particular velocity times the length of a ruler. No, 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 times the velocity. Then we integrate to add up all the states and we include a normalization constant. And this is awesome, awesomely useless. This integral is a complete bust. It equals zero. It, the, do it yours, it equals zero. It's a special integral, it equals zero. Why is it? Oh, wait a minute. That's exactly what we'd expect. Average velocity? What were you thinking? The particle is just as likely to be moving in the positive x direction as the negative x direction. So you integrate. Of course you're going to get zero. They all cancel out. Average velocity is zero. What we want is speed, not velocity. We want the magnitude of all those vectors. And here's how we'll get it. First, take all those velocity vectors and put their tails at the origin of a 3D axis. And when I say axis, look at the axis, or the three axes. They are velocity vectors in velocity space, which is okay. But wait a minute, this is too many arrows. So what we're gonna do is just put a small dot where the end of the vector would be. We have a swarm of dots. Next, we can count the dots. Let's use spherical coordinates. We'll draw a sphere of a given magnitude or speed and then turn that sphere into a shell by giving it thickness dv. Count all the dots in that shell by using this equation, which is really just the same thing we did for the rulers. Trust me, we start with the probability, the Boltzmann distribution. It gives the density of dots at a given distance from the origin. That's the density, density. Multiply density times the volume of the shell in order to get the total number of dots in that shell. Surface area is 4 pi r squared, then multiply by shell thickness dv. This is velocity space. Remember, the only thing left to do then would be to find normalization constant a. Remember, a's job, it gives us n when we sum everything together. Note that we are now integrating from zero to infinity, zero speed to infinite speed, rather than from negative infinity to positive infinity. That's what got us in trouble the last time. So go ahead, solve the integral, all wait. It's another one of those special integrals that we mentioned before, and there's the solution. And with A, we have finished the derivation of the Maxwell-Boltzmann speed distribution for the particles of an ideal gas. A few go slow, a few go very fast, most go at an intermediate speed. But since we have this fancy equation, let's use it. Let's use it to find the most probable speed, the average speed, and the root mean square velocity. The math here is not too bad, but we'll skip it, just pausing long enough to say that the most interesting result 
is also the most confusing. The root mean square is the square root of the average of the squares. Not too bad. Look it up. Why is that interesting? Because kinetic energy is proportional to velocity squared. In other words, plug the RMS velocity value into the kinetic energy equation and you will get the equipartition theorem. Now that last sentence was not in English. If you understood even half of it, you are doing great. Please keep going. But first, freak out. Freak out. Why? Because these two distributions are not playing nice together. What does the Boltzmann tell us on the left? It tells us that we should have more low energy particles than high energy particles. But Maxwell Boltzmann on the right gives us a lump in the middle there. Doesn't a low speed particle mean low kinetic energy? What am I missing here? Why don't those two distributions look more similar? The answer, because that's what the math says. Deal with it. But I'll try to calm your fears a little bit. This bothered me for a little while. I'll point out that the Maxwell-Boltzmann formula is proportional to e to the negative v squared. That's something it shares with the normal distribution. It gives it the nice smooth top of the lump. Second, these two distributions are more similar than they might look. Remember the root mean squared velocity. It gave us the speed of the average energy particle. So you'll agree that the distribution on the right has more lower than average energy particles and fewer higher than average energy particles, which is all we wanted from the distribution on the left. That's all they wanted to hear. They're happy now and we can move on. With newfound confidence to approach the black body spectrum, which is not exactly the same shape curve and not exactly a similar equation, and we're no longer talking about particles at different speeds. Instead, we're talking about electromagnetic waves at different wavelengths. Okay, so let's count to three. Ready to derive it? One, two, uh, I'm not. Maybe we should ease our way into this one. What do you say? And this, this looks doable. This is the Ray Legene formula. A failed attempt to model black body radiation failed, but not entirely. It does work for longer and longer wavelengths, and it looks familiar too. KT, I know that. That's energy. But I'm less comfortable with that other guy. What's that? term 8 pi lambda to the negative fourth that what is that's the probability density of a given state again this is just like the rulers multiply the probability of a state times the average energy and you'll get the energy of that state this probability though it, it it's i don't like it it's missing something it's missing the boltzmann distribution it's missing the e to the negative e is that what causes the ray Legene's formula to fail well turns out no turns out this part on the left that's the part they got right so where did it come from? And what about Boltzmann? Are we forgetting Boltzmann now? I, I was starting to like that guy. Well, we're not forgetting Boltzmann entirely, but let's focus on this part on the left here. This 8 pi lambda to the negative fourth. Where did that come from? And what are we talking about? We're talking about electromagnetic waves. Where do they come from? From vibrating electrons. But just like other standing waves, not all frequencies for these vibrating electrons are possible. First, let's write this expression for the wavelength, and then let's rearrange this expression for frequency. Look at L. What is L? Good question. We'll come back to what is L. Is it the size of our toaster? One away, yes. But the size of the black body should not matter. In other words, we're going to get rid of L. In other words, we're going to try to have L cancel out, or if we can't do that, we'll just set the value to 1 which sounds like it's not a smart thing to do, but we'll, we'll, you'll see, it'll, it'll end up working out. And again, if, as long as we get an equation that describes the black body spectrum, we'll be happy. First, if you had a good time in velocity space, welcome to frequency space. Wait a minute, it's a three-dimensional oven, right? So we can have oscillators vibrating in three different dimensions. Each dot here represents a possible three-dimensional frequency vector. These dots, if you believe the equation, are equally spaced, but notice that only one of the eight quadrants is occupied. No negative frequencies. Can I talk about one of the eight quadrants? I, I don't know. Just like we did with the speed distribution, we will add up all these states by drawing spherical shells, surface area 4 pi f squared, width of the shell df, good, but wait, we're talking about electromagnetic waves. These things can exist in two different polarization states, so we need to multiply by two, which really bothered me at first. When I first read this proof, that, that step just seemed really hand wavy in it, and I didn't like it, so I got another book and checked a couple other websites, but they all said the same things, and, and again, if we end up with an equation that works, we'll take it, but we are getting far down the rabbit hole. Or maybe you can think of it this way. Remember degrees of freedom? Just say, hey, we got electromagnetic waves. They have an additional degree of freedom. 
Anyway, this is our best hope so far, and what are we doing? We're counting up the number of oscillators. They are evenly distributed in rectangular coordinates, not necessarily in spherical coordinates, so we're just going to find the volume of the shell. Don't forget to divide by 8 for the quadrant thing, multiply 2 for the polarization thing, and we have the number of oscillators in a given three-dimensional frequency magnitude thing. Unfortunately, that's not what we want. Instead, we wanted the density of these oscillators, which is the number of oscillators divided by volume. And the volume of this box in frequency space, now it's a cube, and there it is. But what about L? We wanted, to L, we wanted L to go away, but here it is still, and it hasn't gone away yet. What, what is L again? It's the size of the cavity, the dimension that gives the lower limit to the allowed frequency. Note, the frequency has no upper limit, and that's a problem. Anyway... We were going to let L equal 1. That'll give us a size-independent formula. You could say we are writing an equation for the black body distribution per volume. Anyway, this gives us an expression for the density of the oscillators and allows us to write a distribution equation, the ray Legene's law. Again, the total energy emitted at a given wavelength equals the probability of that state times the average energy of that state. Note, we have two assumptions here, number one, that the wavelength of the oscillator matches the wavelength of the radiation. Well, that turns out to be true. Number two, that the average energy of these oscillators is kT. And that equation was so successful for the ideal gas that nobody wanted to question it. Nobody until Max Planck. Hold on, Max. I know you want to get involved in this story, but you're, oh, just wait a second because the equation, we, we have this in terms of frequency. We want it in terms of wavelength. So let's rearrange. That can be done and inserted and completed and graphed. Notice this graph even makes sense. As lambda increases, energy goes to zero. As lambda gets shorter, energy goes to infinity. And that unfortunate fact was given a cool name. The ultraviolet catastrophe. You're going to name a band. Consider that now. We are finally ready to derive Planck's distribution, but no. First, one more thing. Let's look at the y-axis. This is a little bit different than for the Maxwell-Boltzmann speed distribution. There, we were talking about number of particles on the y-axis. Here, we're talking about energy, or some graphs say energy density, or even spectral radiance, which is another cool name. And, and that even kind of makes a little bit of sense. Look at the ray Legene's equation, kT. That gives energy. So this is a density of state times the energy of state equation. Now here's the deal. That would give a distribution for the number of photons, but only if the photons all had equal energy. And again, that's what Ray Legene's assumed that all the photons had equal energy, but that's not true. So Ray Legene's may have thought they were finding a photon distribution equation, but Planck, Planck knew he was talking about energy. What part of the black body's energy is radiated at any given wavelength? So if you see that equation, I mean, some people think about more photons, fewer photons. That's kind of true. Not, not really true. Not totally false, but not true. The key will be to get rid of that KT term. Oh, look, hey, a distribution, a Boltzmann distribution. Finally, it came back to us. And it looks like we're going to need another 1 over lambda term. So if you're ordering out for pizza, get another 1 over lambda term. We're going to need one of those. Oh, and uh, one more thing. Uh, aren't we supposed to be inventing quantum mechanics? When does that happen? Here. It turns out that Ray Legene's had already done most of the work. He suggested those standing wave oscillators. He found the density. Planck just used the additional step of letting those oscillators have different energies. This does make sense. If you grab a string and try to shake it to make the standing waves, the higher frequency waves are harder to make if you're shaking that string. And we should mention here that Planck had no idea what his constant would end up being. It turns out to be really small. But he did know that the frequencies of the oscillators are quantized. Now, if only we had a way of finding the distribution of these energy states. We do! The Boltzmann distribution and energy equals NHF, where N is an integer, not the number of particles or anything like that. N here is an integer. Now, for an ideal gas, we let energy equal one half mv squared, and then we integrate it from zero speed to infinite speed. V could vary continuously. Velocity, all different velocities were possible, so we integrated. This time, we're going to use a summation instead of an integral. Quantum mechanics 
is born, which is strange because it seems like we're going backwards. Most students do summations and limits and then they move their way on to integrals, but here we're going from integrals back. Can we say back to summations? Anyway, that summation, that sigma, quantum mechanics is born. Pop quiz now, Let's see who's still paying attention here. What expression should we use for the energy of the state? That's right, NHF. No hairy fingernails. Next step, let's find A. A normalizes the distribution and gives us a total energy density of one. And that was easy. Just remember what we're doing. We're finding an expression for average energy so we can insert it into the Ray Legene's law in place of that KT term, which doesn't work. And we've got one. And we have a clever plan too. Notice what we can do here. Multiply the numerator and the denominator by the quantity e to the hf over kt minus 1. Why is that so clever? You can see that with a simpler example, but one that matches up with what we're doing. This is your last major hurdle. We're giving birth to quantum mechanics here, so hold your breath and think foil. Foil. Foil magic. All those dang coefficients went away. And that's just what we're doing for Planck's equation. We're making those coefficients in the numerator go away so that the top series and the series on the bottom cancel out and we are done. Just as long as we convert from frequency to wavelength. Hey, look, it's that one over lambda term I wanted. Nice, that's great. Let's plug it into the Rayleigh-Jeans equation and then we're done. And it works. It gives you the curve you were looking for. And since it works, we can be confident to say that the energy of a photon is proportional to its frequency, and energy is quantized, and quantum mechanics is born.